Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Veg Grower Podcast. My name's Richard and I want to encourage and inspire you to grow more of your own food and I do this by sharing what I've been up to in my own allotment and my own vegetable garden. Now, coming up this week, Bank Holiday Weekend, I hope you've had a good extra long weekend. We start off with the results of the underwear in the soil test, as well as a bit of a discussion on the mulches I've been testing this year. We've also got a bit of a talk on nematodes and the review of the Milkwood Permaculture Living Handbook. That's all coming up, so come meet me out in the garden and I'll share with you the results of the underwear test. Now you might remember a few weeks ago I started an experiment to test how healthy my soil here at home really is. This was quite a simple experiment. Basically I buried some of my old underwear into some of my garden beds and we left it for a few weeks to see just how much of the underwear would be left and this weekend I've dug up the underwear to see how much was left. Now I buried these in all four of my beds and pretty much the results was the same on all four beds. I dug up the underwear and in all there was quite a few holes where animals and insects and rotting had eaten away at my underwear. Now the healthier and the more life there is in the soil, the less of this underwear we would see. You don't have to use underwear, I guess t-shirts and things like that, natural fibres would work just as well. Obviously things like the elastic would be left behind and that's to be expected. But overall my underwear, about 75% of it has disintegrated. I think that's a good good sign that my soil here is in pretty good condition and I'm not surprised we've added plenty of compost over the years we look after the soil I don't use pesticides I don't try and use chemicals or anything like that so we have good healthy soil and I think it pays off when you see the results of things like this so I'm very happy overall with that result we've got good healthy soil and good healthy soil means we get good healthy plants in the long run but one of the other things that we have also been experimenting this year is with some different mulches now you might recall way back at the beginning of the growing season I mulched all my beds with some straw that I had left over but I did have to remove it from quite a few of my beds because I felt the slugs and snail problem was being exasperated by this straw So I removed it from most of my beds, but I did leave it in two of my beds, my tomato bed and one of my newer beds. And what I've got to say, the beds that I left the straw in, we haven't had to water. It's held onto water in the soil really, really well. But also we've had very, very little weeding as well. Now, I cannot say that this is a conclusive result because we've had a very, very wet year this year. So in terms of watering, it's been pretty good from that front. But if we had a hot summer, I don't know if it would have made any difference. Perhaps we'll try again next year. But in terms of weeding, certainly, the straw did keep down the weeds. So I definitely, definitely think there was an advantage to that. But I come back to my four beds where I did remove the straw from here a little earlier on this year. And I've experimented with four different types of mulch. We had the Rocket Grow mulch, the Heart of Eden mulch, a grass mulch and a compost mulch. Now again, I've got to say this is not a scientific experiment. All four of my beds have something different growing in it and different results would be found. But each mulch I found had different advantages and disadvantages. So the first bed that I mulched with grass clippings. Now I use grass clippings quite a bit on the allotment, mainly because I'm cutting the grass anyway. It's a free resource of a material that we would normally throw into the compost bin. But it's a material we're producing anyway. It's there on the allotment. We're cutting the grass. And the same here at home. We're cutting the grass. We might as well pop that grass to good use. Did it reduce weeds? On the whole, yes. 
but some of the stronger weeds did grow through the grass. Did it reduce watering? Again, yes, but we still did have to add a bit of water and I can't say it was 100% effective, certainly not as effective as the straw bed. So it did work and it was a free resource, but in comparison to some of the others, I don't think it's as good. So my next bread, which is my brassica bed, we mulched that with compost. Now this is my homemade compost from my compost bins. I just placed it around some of our plants as they grew. And actually, it didn't do too bad. It certainly reduced the amount of watering that we needed to do. Again, it's been a wet year, so that's a, not necessarily a, a great year to test this out. But did it reduce weeding? And yes, it did but I would say it wasn't the best for reducing weeds, partly because although my compost gets very, very hot, there are still weed seeds in the compost and they did come through. It was effective at reducing weeds from the ground and also I think the plants actually grew better from it because of course compost has a lot of nutrients that the plants were absorbed at the same time as well so a lot of advantages for using compost again this is a free resource if you can build up enough compost then it works fantastic now my heart of eden compost now this was one i was actually sent the bag from heart of eden and it only covered half of my bed so I would have had to buy some more. Unfortunately, none of my garden centres seem to sell it near me. So I've had to have ordered it online. That would have meant that we'd have to pay postage and packaging. That, for me, doesn't make it a worthwhile mulch. But the half of the bed that I did cover with this mulch, again, watering was dramatically reduced. Dramatically reduced. It did very, very well at that but we did get weeds growing through. Not as much as the half that wasn't covered, but we did get weeds growing through. And in particular, things like bindweed and brambles grew through. So not completely foolproof, but again, the plants that did grow in this bed did grow quite well. So there was a definite advantage with the nutrients with this mulch. Now this brings me to the rocket grow. It's quite windy here today, but this brings me to the rocket grow. So rocket grow, this mulch, again, I got sent a bag and it half covered my pea beds. I did go down to a local garden centre that sells it and I covered up the other half of the bed with it as well. But what I would say, where my peas were already growing, I didn't mulch right up to the peas. And what I found is that the weeds grew where the mulch wasn't they grew amongst the peas so for weed suppression i've got to say rocket grow mulch came out on top watering was very minimal again as i say difficult year this year but i think i'm going to try these experiments continuing on in future years with the same beds to see how they go up watering very minimum and the plants seem to grow quite well so that leads us to what do I think the results were. In terms of water retention, I think straw has came out on top. The tomato beds have not needed any water in at all and the tomatoes have produced are fantastic. So straw came out on top of that. The downside, of course, slugs and snails. The cheapest would be the grass clippings and that did okay. I cannot say it's the best mulch, but it's better than nothing. I feel the compost grew the best plants, but we did get quite a few weeds on it. And in terms of buying in mulch, I think the Rocket Grow came out on top. But that's purely because I can access a Rocket Grow quite easily, and I feel the weeds reduction made it worthwhile. Now, I'd love to know what mulches you use and whether you've buried any underwear to see how good your soil is as well. If you have them, please do get in touch. Right, let's find out what's been going on in the Supporters Club this week and then I'll meet you in the kitchen where I'm going to talk about nematodes. Well, I hope you are enjoying this podcast so far. If you are, then please do rate and review on your podcast provider. Rating and reviewing really only takes you a few seconds, but it really does help us out quite a bit and get us found by more people who might also be after learning how to grow their own food. 
Now, if you are really enjoying this podcast, you want to help support this podcast and keep it running, then please consider becoming a member of our supporters club. For just £5 a month, it costs to be a member. You get access to extra behind-the-scenes podcasts, as well as a collection of seeds sent to your door every month. And what's special about these seeds is that they can be sown in that very month. So August seeds we've sown throughout August. You also get a mini newspaper in this pack as well, which just gives you a bit of information about the seeds that we are sowing. Now, I also grow these seeds as well, so we are growing, I like to think, as a community. Now, this week, we've been sowing some spinach. Spinach is a delicious vegetable. It's a cool weather crop, so sowing it now will give us a decent crop right into the winter. Now, if that is something that will interest you, head to thevegrowerpodcast.co.uk to find out more and sign up. And I really do appreciate every single person that helps support this podcast. Right, let's get back to the gardening. Well, here I am back in my kitchen. And if you've listened to this podcast, you will know I use my kitchen quite a bit for growing a lot of edible plants. The window seals I use for growing are turmeric, our gingers and our cardamoms, as well as a wide range of other edibles, including my vanilla orchid. But not only that, I also start a lot of my seedlings off in here. This is somewhere under grow lights with heated propagators on a shelf that I've built in order to start our seedlings off. The idea being that the greenhouse, I think, can sometimes either get too cold or too hot for seedlings. So this was just a happy medium, somewhere where I could look after them and protect them quite well. But one of the downsides that has been happening more and more is the invasion we've had of compost flies. Now, I had this problem right at the beginning of this year when we were full on in seed sowing mode. And what I did then was I switched to a queer based compost. My idea being that the compost flies were coming from the compost because of course it's a lot of green waste compost going on these days. The coir based compost I thought wouldn't have any compost flies and I've got to say we didn't get any more compost flies once I used the coir based compost but the downside the coir compost can be quite expensive but also I noticed my plants just weren't growing as well so I went back to our normal compost but actually what I did is I've started using a higher quality compost on the hope that we weren't going to get so many problems and throughout most of the year it was okay but a few weeks ago we started noticing that we were definitely getting quite a few more compost flies or scarred flies as they're also known as. Now this was upsetting my wife and quite rightly in some ways nobody wants flies flying around their kitchen so she sort of said to me you've got to do something about this or all your plants will be outside. So the first thing I did is I moved back in one of my carnivorous plants one of my sundews. Now I don't like to use any pesticides as I'm sure you're aware I prefer natural methods And I don't really like killing anything at the same time. So swatting flies is out of the question. But I don't have a problem when nature takes care of flies itself. The carnivorous sundews, which are basically a bug plant, they have these sort of sticky leaves that flies get trapped on and a carnivorous plant holds onto them and absorbs the nutrients from the flies. Sundews, of course, being a bug plant, they grow in places where there's very little nutrition in the soil. So they gain their nutrition from eating effectively flies and bugs and insects so I put one of these in here and almost immediately we started to notice a difference with the reduction in flies but it didn't stop there I had to go away and do a bit of research about what I knew about scarred flies and what I discovered is there's actually two stages of scarred flies the flies of course they fly around they mate and then they lay eggs in the compost these eggs then hatch into larvae which are known for eating roots and if you get a lot of them they could eat all your roots of all your plants those larvae then pupate into flies and that's the cycle going on so carnivorous plants did start to break that cycle but I decided I wanted to take some action against the larvae as well. Now I'm sure 
you have heard of nematodes. Nematodes are a microscopic worm and there's many different types out there. And these microscopic worms are parasites to certain insects. Now, slugs and snails are known to have a particular type of nematode that will attack slugs and snails. And what this means is that you have to get the correct nematode for the problem that you're having. So I had to get the correct nematodes for scarred flies, which again, I went on to andamat.co.uk and they weren't too badly priced. I bought a pack for under £10, including delivery. It arrived within a few days. I was very, very happy with that. Now, the kit did come with some sticky traps as well, which I haven't used, but all I was really interested in, the nematodes. Now, the nematodes come in this little sachet, a powder that I poured into a jug, and we added one and a half litres of water, which we stirred up well, and then we had to take that one and a half litres and dilate that down into another 15 litres of water. It's quite a bit of water overall. And then we watered that onto the soil, and that meant that all these parasitic worms go out and do their job. They attack these larvae and now we don't have any compost flies. I don't think we have any compost larvae either. I haven't seen the larvae in the first place. But it's definitely, definitely cured the problem. And it's been very, very quick at doing the job as well. So I'm definitely starting to turn myself as a fan onto nematodes. I've always steered clear of nematodes in the past, partly because I've always felt that they are quite expensive. But now I've seen the results and one of my allotment neighbours says he uses them on his potatoes and he gets no problems with slugs and snails on his allotment. So it's starting to make me think that perhaps we need to start looking at this. The trouble is with slugs and snails nematodes, one, they are very expensive, especially to do a whole allotment and then your neighbours may also need them as well, so it goes on and on. But you also have to make several applications. But they'll come back to the fact that this is all about bringing in the beneficial insects once again. Even the microscopic worms, the nematodes, are beneficial insects. So I am converted. I am converted into looking into more of these nematodes and particularly maybe even buying in things if we get problems with white fly and things like that i am looking more into buying in these beneficial insects i'd love to hear more if you've had any results with this because it has been a real eye-opener for me and potentially it saved my marriage right the final thing we're going to be talking about in just a moment is the book review for the book of the month but in the meantime Let's find out what Chef Scott has for us this week. Chopping all the veggies, sizzle in the air. Chef Scott with the magic, smells are everywhere. Water starts to boil, onions hit the pan. Recipe of the week, let the feast begin. Cooking with Chef Scott, flavors come alive. Hi, it's Scott here with this week's recipe. And I have been picking lots of aubergines recently. And this year I grew a variety called White Knight. And they have been prolific. So I've been making many dishes with them. But my favourite dish I have made this year is this week's recipe. Moroccan meatball and aubergine bake. Beautiful lamb meatballs and aubergines. Baked in a rustic tomato sauce. And topped with feta and pomegranate. So it's a good one to use up our homegrown tomatoes as well. And if you follow a plant-based diet, you could swap the lamb meatballs for plant-based meatballs or smoked tofu works really well. So let's not delay and head to the kitchen and hear how it's made. As usual, you can find this recipe and others on the vegrowerpodcast.co.uk and on my Instagram page, c to table plot 13 this recipe will serve four to six people and you will need for the rustic tomato sauce one white onion diced one stick of celery diced one red chilli cut in half two preserved lemons cut into quarters one kilogram of fresh chopped tomatoes you can leave the skins on one teaspoon of paprika one teaspoon of razzle hanout 
two teaspoons of harissa paste. And for the meatballs and aubergine, 700 grams of lamb mince, one diced onion, sweat it until soft and then cooled, 10 grams of chopped mint, 10 grams of chopped coriander, one teaspoon of razzle hanout, one teaspoon of ground cumin, one teaspoon of ground coriander, and 250 grams of aubergines cut into large dice, or if using small aubergines, just cut in half. And to garnish, diced feta, pomegranate seeds, chopped coriander, and that's the ingredients you need. Method. Start by making the rustic tomato sauce. Do this by sweating off the onions and celery until soft. Then add the rest of the ingredients to the pan and cover with a lid and cook on a medium low heat for 15 minutes. Then remove the lid and cook for a further 5 to 10 minutes to reduce and then set aside. Now make the meatballs by mixing all the ingredients for the meatballs together and then shape into golf ball size meatballs. Now in a hot frying pan see the meatballs until golden brown and set aside and then do the same with the aubergine and fry until golden brown. Now pour the tomato sauce into an oven proof dish and then arrange the meatballs on an aubergines on top of that and bake in a preheated oven set at 180 degrees celsius for 30 minutes or until the meatballs are cooked. Then garnish with the feta, pomegranate and coriander and enjoy. And that's the recipe done and that's it from me this week. Now this month we started a new feature and this feature evolved because I rediscovered the joys of our public libraries. The ability to go and borrow a book on a particular subject or anything like that for free, read it and then return it. That, I, I don't know why I stopped using libraries, in all honesty. I tended to buy books for years. Now, the book for this month is a book I borrowed called The Milkwood Permaculture Handbook. And I chose this because I've always been intrigued with permaculture, but I've never been able to really get my head around what it is. Now, my understanding of permaculture was that it was a method of gardening that worked with nature and it was a way to help you live as well. But I really wanted this book to help get my head around the whole idea a little bit better. Now I've read this book for this last month and I've got to be honest I did find this book very very tricky to really get into. I found that my mind was wandering around quite a bit. Now I do suffer from ADD or we believe I do anyway so I do have to factor that in place but what I found is that when my mind wandered, it's because often the book just didn't draw me in enough for me to pay attention. And there was quite a few sentences that I just felt were a little bit too long and a little bit not to the point. Now, I've got an example of this that I'm going to read to you, which really exemplifies what I mean. And it reads like this. What is permaculture? Permaculture is in many ways a simple goal of living in a functional, meaningful relationship to our ecosystems, with reciprocity at the core of that relationship. A goal of living in a connected, meaningful way that benefits land, waters, life and community as well as meeting our own needs for a fulfilling life. Now, I did get my wife to read that part as well and just to see what she thought of it. My wife does a lot of reading, so, you know, she does she does know her books. But she sort of said to her that she had switched off with that one sentence as well. Too many apostrophes and too long. And for me, that was the problem that I had for it. I like my books and I like to get my information pretty much straight away in an easy to understand way not as what I would call a word salad now for many readers they might like that type of wording but for me just went way above my head far too complicated and I just wanted it pure simple information no, I did read on through this book and it did give me a much better understanding of permaculture and all its ethics. And I've got a bit of a better understanding about it. 
I have heard a lot about permaculture in the past and I've always liked its ethics. The ethics are, of course, for caring for the earth, caring for people and sharing surplus. Now, this is much the principle that I have here at the Veg Grower Podcast. I believe in looking after the earth, looking after our animals and insects, caring for the people and friends in our life and also sharing the surplus with friends and family as well. Something that I've, you've often heard me try and get more and more in our lives. Now, not only does permaculture has these ethics, it also has quite a few principles. And again, I found these principles to be a bit like rules, but because there's so many, I just found it difficult to really work out how we could achieve all this. Now, one of these principles, again, I don't think the principles are wrong, but one of these principles was to observe and interact. And the idea here is that we observe our gardens and our plants and assess what action to take rather than just reacting to what we are told to do. Now, an example of this is that we might be told to spray pesticides on our plants before we see any problems and actually what we should be doing is observing and seeing if we actually get the start of problems and then react to that be it getting some natural predators in again i agree with that sort of principle it's something i try and do myself i don't believe in just spraying everything with pesticides as i'm sure you are aware but trying to get that information across in an easy to understand way can be quite tricky As I said, there's many more principles in this whole permaculture idea, and this book does share them as the cornerstone of permaculture. Now, I read on with this book, and what I realised is that permaculture is not just about growing food. It is a model for a way of life, a more self-sufficient life with less waste and more self-reliance. And it involves often creating your own cleaning materials and cosmetics. Now, I've often dabbled with creating our own cleaning materials and soaps and things like that. And this was using stuff from the garden. So I did like this idea, and it tallied in with the way I kind of live my life. The biggest trouble with this is that it does take a lot of time, time that we may not have. Now again, I did feel that a lot of the information I was reading in this book very much found like the hippies would say in 1960s. Now, I've got to say that the problems that I feel we have in many ways these days were what the hippies of the 1960s, I hate using that term, it's not derogatory when I say hippies, but they were warning that to us back in the 1960s. And the depletion of soil is a big concern. Farmers these days are noting just how much harder and harder it is to grow food in the soil because the the soil has been depleted of the nutrients. They're having to use more feeds and fertilisers because of a loss of nutrients. Now, we know that composting is a good alternative to this. In fact, it's probably the best alternative, better than feeds and fertilisers. But creating enough compost can be tricky. This is where wool working together to try and combat this issue is the way forward. Now, overall, I did like this book, but I did not enjoy reading it. That's my answer. It gave me a better understanding of permaculture, but I still have many, many more questions. And I feel that had it been delivered to me in an easier to understand way, I would have got my head around it much easier. Too much word salad was my biggest problem with it. Now, this, again, might appeal to some of you. And if it does, head down to your library, see if you can find the book and give it a read. Alternatively, I have added a link to Amazon for this book as well. And if you do have uh, any thoughts on it, then please do let me know. Now, in the future, I hope that I might find some more books on permaculture that will help me with my understanding of this. But Who knows what the future will bring. However, my book for the next month is called The Urban Vegetable Patch, A Modern Guide to Growing Sustainably Wherever Your Space by Paul Grace. I'll add links to that as well in the blog post. Now, I'm looking forward to reading this book and we will see what happens. But it is time now for Lee's Tip of the Week. Veg Grower Army, how are you all doing? It is I, Skinny Jean Gardner, on week five of the six weeks holiday some of you are going to be going back soon some of you have still got a few weeks off but i am here to tell you what you can do with the kids 
down on the allotment. Now, last week, I talked about wildlife. And one thing that can really help our plots is by growing some flowers. And I, personally, love wildflowers. And now is a great time to make wildflower seed balls. All you have to do is mix a compost with uh, some wildflower seeds, a little bit of clay, mix it all together with some water, and turn them into little balls of joy. Now, we're not going to throw these out yet. But it's a great activity to get the kids doing while you potter around the allotment. Then you dry them out at home or in your shed. And then we're going to throw them out at the end of September in an area of our allotment that we maybe have turned over and got rid of some weeds. Then those seeds sit under the ground throughout the whole of winter, just hiding beneath the soil. And come next spring, early next spring as well, we'll get loads of wildflowers that will pop up and help all of our other plants grow, bringing in the bees to help pollinate our beautiful vegetables. So it's a great one to get the kids' hands messy and give them something to do while you're down at the end of the allotment. Well, thank you very much to Lee for that tip. Thank you so much to Scott as well for the recipe. I've got to say, it sounds absolutely delicious. Well, we are coming to the end of this week's podcast. And if you have enjoyed this podcast, I really hope you have, then please consider leaving a rate and review on your podcast provider. Rate and review, it only takes you a few seconds, but it really does mean the world to us and help us get found by more people. Now, on the back of last week's podcast, Lynn left us a review over on Spotify. She says... Hi Richard, must say I love Scott's intro music. Great surprise. The information about greenhouses was so useful. Good summary that was easy to understand and not too complicated. Sounds a bit like that book review. As for cooking sweet corn, mine never makes it home. I was in the camping stove in the shed and it's cooked within seconds of being picked. Absolutely best taste that you will ever get anywhere else prices. Totally agree with that. I totally agree with that now added to that i also received an email from david from growmad.co.uk growmad has actually featured our podcast on his website do do go check him out Uh, he says hi richard love the episode on greenhouse cladding have to agree polycarbonate is a perfect material for greenhouses i have a poly eco and two handcrafted structures both clad with it when it comes to veg storage, I preserve a ton of our production into pickles, sauces, and using fermentation, etc. All good ways of preserving these vegetables, of course. My favourite rhubarb variety is raspberry red. It's early, forces well, and is incredibly sweet when cooked down. And finally, as always, I've enjoyed Lee's garden tips. Thanks, Richard. Keep up the great work. David. Thank you, David. Same to you. Keep up the good work. Well, we are approaching the end of this week's podcast. Time to wrap it up and say goodbye. As I said, if you've enjoyed this podcast, then please do rate and review, just like David and just like Lynn. Added to that, if you've also enjoyed this podcast, then please consider becoming a member of our supporters club for just £5 a month. Get extra behind-the-scenes podcasts and a collection of seeds and our monthly newspaper. If you want to get in touch, my email address is richard at the vegrowpodcast.co.uk. Alternatively, you can head to the vegrowpodcast.co.uk, leave a comment on the bottom of a blog post, or leave a voicemail using our speak pipe service. Very simple to use, just go to the vegrowpodcast.co.uk and click on the button. And finally, don't forget to check us out on social media. We will be back again next time, so until then. Please take care.